Good afternoon. I'm Manthea Hancox and the CEO of the Scanlon Foundation Research Institute. Welcome to this wonderful opportunity to talk today about uh, polls and how to be alert to their pitfalls and to successfully interpret them. First of all, though, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting and uh, the lands that we're coming from. And in the spirit of reconciliation, pay my respects to elders, past, present, and all First Nations people. Um, I would like to introduce uh, our guests for this session. Uh, Emeritus Professor Andrew Marcus has uh, worked with the Scanlon Foundation since 2007. Uh, and is an expert in polling and methodology, well, certainly in survey methodology, and has um, really some tremendous insights to share about how to interpret surveys and how to understand what's going on uh, in the sorts of um, information that you might receive. Um, Andrew Marcus comes to us from Monash University, and I'm delighted that he's here with us today. And I'd also like to um, introduce Sabra Lane, who hosts the ABC's AM program from Hobart and curates The Bright Side. For 13 years, Sabra covered federal politics in Canberra for ABC's Radio Current Affairs Division, and for a time was the chief political correspondent on the nightly TV of Current Affairs program, 7.30. She's been a journalist for more than 30 years, working in commercial TV as well, and began her career in Adelaide as a producer for the 10 Network. Both guests will provide us with a short 10 to 15 minute introduction to their views and experiences with polls and the representative of the views of uh, society through those polls. And then we will have plenty of time for Q&A, which I would ask you to submit via the chat function. This webinar, as you will all know by now, I'm sure is being recorded um, as you will, have, yes, as I'm sure you will have noticed. So um, hopefully that's not a problem for anybody. Um, so on that note, I would uh, like to invite Professor Marcus to introduce us to the topic. Um, Andrew, I know you've got some slides to share, so um, if you'd like to bring them up, we can get started. Okay, yeah, I've got the slides up now. I assume you can see the man here. We, we can. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you for this opportunity to discuss um, interpretation of polling. And before I start, I'd also like to pay um, my respects to the traditional owners um, of the land. I'm actually in Victoria, so um, the Wurundjeri people. Pay my respects to the traditional owners there, um, descendants and emerging leaders. So thank you. All right, so why do we need good surveys? Why do we even discuss this? Well, the main um, emphasis for surveys is in terms of predicting elections and, and charting the fortunes of the various political parties. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about um, political um, surveys. But I think, you know, in a more fundamental way, where the media probably does not uh, give adequate attention in the main, and uh, Surveys which help to understand ourselves, not just in political terms, to understand shifts in attitudes. What I call the separation of noise from substance, the people who um, get a lot of media attention uh, because they draw attention to themselves, who are prominent in social media, as distinct from the balance of opinion in a society, as I've said. Um, and surveys, I think, help us to form an understanding of the balance of society on the basis of reliable data rather than impressions. I'll just give you a couple of examples from the Scanlon Foundation surveys. For example, trust in government and on what's happened with that. Um, and as you can see, we've got there as surveys going back to 2007. Um, and it looks at, say, the popularity of the Rudd government, the collapse of trust in government, and then what happened during the pandemic, um, which again, a, a very marked turning to government um, to basically get us out of the mess if possible. Um, and for the first time in our surveys, we had a, a majority 
um, indicating that you can trust the government in Canberra. So that's sort of broad perspective. Or how well is the federal government responding to uh, the pandemic? And the very high levels of approval in 2020, uh, and then quite a marked decline in 2021. Um, with regard to lockdown restrictions, I think this is an example of noise as opposed to substance, because the people who protest the lockdown restrictions um, garner for themselves a lot of media attention. And we have a political movement, um, the Palmer Party, which is um, going to give us freedom, um, lots of advertising. And, and this is the substance of people who consider that uh, lockdown restrictions were required. Another aspect is we're concerned about, you know, the, the racism in the far right in Australian society. But what's happened with a strong negative views? Now, I haven't got time to go into it here, but what I'm showing is the people who have strong negative views have over the last couple of years actually diminished in number, according to our surveys, rather than increased. These are things we might discuss, but this illustrates for me the capacity of polls to give us a deep insight into society that we may not get um, by any other means. Now, the challenge for journalists in, in dealing with polls, um, the pressure that journalists are under, and, and this is a, uh, I've taken from the British Polling Council guide for journalists. Um, the need to produce copy in a hurry um, and the temptation just to reproduce uh, a press release that accompanied the poll data as opposed to um, a reasonable interpretation of the evidence. Now, I'm going to be talking about two different types of polls. Polling focused on electoral fortunes and polling which is dealing with social issues. And I think that the big challenge for the media, obviously in both areas, but there's a lot of emphasis goes into the electoral um, aspect, not much in terms of interpreting social issues. I've got a checklist of things to consider when looking at a poll. How was the sample obtained? What is the size of the sample? What is the nature of the questions that were being asked? And what is the analysis of the findings that is being produced? So I'll talk about these briefly, each in turn. So the, the mainstay of polling, as you may well know, uh, was telephone surveys. And this was the case probably from the 1960s um, till relatively recent times. But what's happened is that telephone surveys don't really work so well anymore. Telephone surveys were great for creating a random sample, obtaining a random sample, but people are very unlikely to uh, respond um, to an unknown caller today. Um, the participation rate on te in telephone polling um, would be around 5% with many uh, surveys experiencing that around 5%. And, and that 5%, even the people you most want to reach uh, would even be below 5%. Why would you people you most want to reach, uh, reach to get a good sample of the population? So the, the mainstay of polling now is online panels. There is, however, only one probability-based online panel in Australia. That's the Social Research Centre's Life in Australia. Most panels are non-probability. That is, people opted to join the panels. And even though the results may be weighted, so to represent the population, the people who agree to join a non-probability online panel may not be uh, representative of the population. There's another means is robocalls, uh, but robocalls um, may be criticised on a number of different bases. Um, it's a quick and easy way 
to get some sort of indication may not be all that reliable. So a second issue is the sample size. And the question is the sample that we're using, this leads on from the first point, how reliable is it? And the main point I'm wanting to emphasize is that even with a, a good sample of 1,000 to 1,500, the margin of error in ideal circumstances is two to three percent plus or minus. That means it, the survey can only tell us that it's in the range 47 to 53 percent, not exactly 49 percent, not exactly 51 percent. A further problem is that of subsamples. So if you want to say in political polling, you want to get an understanding of the fortunes in different states of Australia. With a sample of even 1,500, that can be a challenge. And the level of reliability in subsamples goes up. So if it's 300, in the best circumstances, it could be plus or minus 6% margin of error, which is huge. It's also a problem that you can't actually calculate margin of error with a non-probability sample. Um, so there's a further issues. So a caution, beware of small differences. If a poll says that 51% support something and 49% oppose it, you can't actually be sure uh, that the supporters are in larger number than those who oppose. All we can safely say is that the results are close to being evenly divided. Or just today, if you want to go on the website of the ABC News, there's a discussion of polling. And Peter Lewis, who's the director at Essential, says something that moves a couple of percent doesn't mean anything. A third issue of the four is question wording. Does this important to understand and to look for what sort of questions are being asked? And are there a number of different questions being asked or just one question? Now, again, ideally, as the British Polling Council says, <clears throat> a poll will ask more than one question, coming at a subject from different angles. I can illustrate this. Say that you want to get a sense of public attitude to immigration. I've got four, four different ways of looking at that. Is intake of 190,000 too high or is immigration too high? Is growth too fast? Or do you support a cut of 10%? See, none of these questions are good, but they're all questions that are being used in polling to try to get a sense of immigration. They're not good because they're all couched in negative terms, too high, too fast, cut. And if you put a number in a poll, such as 190,000, the problem that you have um, is that 190,000 will mean different things to different people. What does it mean? Is it big or small? So it's a big challenge for uh, people to respond to that. So in the Scanlon Foundation surveys, we have a whole range of different questions, um, more than 30 questions to understand attitudes to immigration and cultural diversity. And we can then track how each of these questions and sort of responses that you get. Obviously, I don't have time to go into it here, but the point I'm making is just one question in itself um, does not really tell us all that much. Now, with regard to interpretation, this is the fourth point. It's really important not to try to understand findings in isolation, but to see if, if there's enough data to establish trend. Has this survey been run before? What was the answer that it was obtained before? Because it tends to be a naive assumption, let's say that if we get more than 50%, then that's a fable result. But in actual fact, we have to understand the nature of the question and how that question is typically answered. And so it may be that you get 70% agreement and that's a bad result because for that sort of question, you in past have got 
or you might find that 30% is a very good result. Um, because in the past, um, that sort of question got 20 or 25%. So you need trend to establish and not just to look at a question in isolation, not just to look at a poll the first time it's been run. One of the good things about polling on electoral fortunes of the parties is that we do have trend data. So this is the news poll from the Australian. And, and you can see that there's tracking of uh, popularity of the two main parties on a two party preferred going back to the last election or before. There's also questions to do with the popularity of the prime minister. And again, we can see the trend data. Although I wanted to highlight this because this is a sort of question um, where we have to understand how is it typically answered? And it's not typically answered in terms of both the incumbent and the leader of the opposition going neck to neck as it is occurring in this case. So to be able to interpret this question, we not only need trend data, we probably would want data prior to the two or three previous elections to see what this actually means. Now, predicting elections in Australia, I'm going to have to stop in a couple of minutes. As I think you're aware, between 2007 and 16, polls accurately predicted outcome of elections, basically 25 out of 26. And in 2019, um, all failed. Why did this happen? Was there problems with the samples? And obviously there were problems in samples. But also, was there a problem that pollsters were adjusting their data so everybody fell into line? A phenomenon known as herding. In 2019, there were 16 polls. They all got it wrong and they all went in the wrong direction. How is that possible? Um, and Professor Brian Schmidt um, won the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, knows a little bit about mathematics. He's a, a vice chancellor of the ANU. He calculated that to get this result, all of the polls being wrong and all basically in the one direction and very similar, the odds were 100,000 to one. So what actually went on in 2019? It's interesting that if we just look at contemporary situation, um, like interpretation of news poll yesterday, and you can see that um, an article is being written on the basis of shifts in opinion, which are very small. Um, and, and the issue becomes like, how is it that this commands headline news when arguably the differences that are being highlighted are within the margin of error and they may not be reliable? So sum up then my key points. The diff polls are difficult to interpret. The very high level of precision that we need within a couple of percentage points is obviously crucial in the context of elections. Probably less important in the context of polling on social issues, which as George Gallup said, are really important to take the pulse of democracy. Is a danger of highlighting findings that are not well grounded. So I think like three key things to look at is how was the sample obtained? Is there evidence of long run trend data that enables us to interpret the findings? And are there a range of questions asked that provide a number of perspectives rather than just one question being asked? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, there is a question though in the chat, which I um, probably should address right now, which is, can you explain exactly what the margin of error is in a simple way and how it's calculated? Oh, sorry, Sabra. Did... I can talk about in a simple way. Uh, I might leave the calculations um, to Andrew, but how about I give my spiel and then we save the questions for the end? Absolutely. So, so it's, um, we, um, I might as well just immediately welcome Sabra and, uh, and to provide us with uh, the journalist's perspective on all of this and what she's learned about her 
poll about polling over her career. So Sabra, you uh, clearly introduced yourself particularly well, so I'll hand it over to you. All right, Anthea, thank you very much. Andrew, thank you very much for your contribution too. Uh, it's really important, I think, that we're having this discussion because I think there's a lot of mystique around polls and there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, among journalists and the general public about what they actually tell us. I want to also say thank you to the Walkley Foundation for, for putting this on because I think it's a really important discussion to have. So roughly every three years as a nation, we vote on who we'd like to represent us in federal government to make decisions about how our precious tax dollars are spent to ensure our safety, prosperity and our health. That's a pretty expensive exercise. Millions to run polling centres, the staff, the IT systems to help tally votes, not to mention the money spent by the actual parties and candidates to win votes and the money doled out to the uh, eligible uh, candidates after uh, the election. That was about, uh, uh, I had 68 million, I think, dollars last time. And this all excludes the amount of money that Clive Palmer spent in the 2019 election. He actually spent $83 million uh, through campaigning, advertising, and he didn't win a seat. So that, there are extraordinary amounts of money uh, being spent around election time. And that it doesn't even factor in the costs of the policies that the politicians promise to deliver if they're successful at winning government. And those elections are in fact the best polls. They're accurate and we trust the Australian Electoral Commission to get it right. But in the meantime, we can't do that on a regular basis to gauge how politicians are managing the country because of the, the actual cost. The next best um, method to test public sentiment, if you like, is opinion polling. That too is pretty expensive. A good one costs about $100,000 to do. It can be useful because, well, let's look at the other possible choices for gauging public sentiment. We've got straw polls. Often they're too small. And well, if you're out in the street handing out straws to people, um, there might be some people who are happy to take your straw, others who won't. Uh, and they'll be only the people walking in the street. That doesn't capture the people working in the offices or those at home, for example. So that's only capturing a very small audience and not very reflective of, of what's happening in the community. And for example, perhaps there are non-English speaking people in the street who may not want to be approached by anyone with a straw. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty flimsy way of, of measuring public sentiment. I'm talking here in jest, of course, hopefully you get what I mean. Internet all-in surveys aren't really a good reflection either because often the people that take part in those surveys are not really reflective of the broader community because usually they're highly motivated individuals, they're very politically engaged people. And that is not representative of swinging voters who in the main end up deciding elections. They don't follow politics generally, and I'm speaking in general terms, generally they don't. Uh, they're definitely not rusted on individuals. And they generally just tune into um, the political goings on around budget time and federal election time. So opinion polls are supposed to work on the principle that anyone in your community could be involved in taking part. And the pollsters conducting those surveys are supposed to weight the results, as the professor talked about earlier. That is, they adjust them for the people who may not be adequately represented. And for example, in 2019, the pollsters realised that they got things wrong. They overestimated Labor's vote in some quarters and they missed the tradie vote, a particular group of voters who were highly paid, uh, but not highly educated and do, who generally don't answer the phone when people uh, are ringing them during their, their business hours, unless it's going to be a customer or a mate. So after that 2019 failure, the polling companies actually got together and formed the Australian Polling Council to improve the quality and understanding of opinion polling and to include a code of practice that they all abide by. Now, most of the polling companies that operate in Australia are members of that, that council, but not all of them. So ultimately, we're left with opinion pollings between elections to gauge public sentiment, to give us an idea of what people think of politicians, the parties and policies that they're putting in place. Now, the problem is in the past, I think, too much has been read into these results and they've been given more prominence perhaps and weight in reporting than they're actually deserved. That's not to say that polls should be ignored. They can be very useful in our reporting, but I think that actually requires us
to be more transparent about what they actually say and to be cautious about them. We know that politicians pay very close attention to them. Politicians who say they don't pay attention to them are clearly lying. We know that. Malcolm Turnbull cited Tony Abbott's losing 30 news polls in a row to challenge Tony Abbott for the leadership. It was something that he came to regret because he also failed his own test, something that his colleagues were keen to point out. And Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd lost their leaderships in part because of poor polling. And internal polling in that time and news poll were used and cited during those ugly, brutal party wars to inflict damage on key players. Now, parties, the political parties, do conduct their own opinion polling. And usually they're loath to hand it out to anyone other than people within their own organisation. Most will share, uh, most will not share their own polling. Uh, so if people want to allude to their own party polling, often they will not give them the full picture of who was involved in that polling, the number of people the questions were asked. So I often uh, tell people to be cautious about uh, so-called internal opinion polling because you're not getting the full picture. So if reporters are offered that polling, they must ask themselves, why am I being given this polling? Who is gaining something from this information about being made public? They're the sorts of questions you need to ask yourself if you're given that polling. Now, polls can be very useful in looking at trends over a particular period of time. This is what um, the professor had talked about earlier, particularly in conducting analysis about how politics is going. But even then, there are some really big caveats around using them and being upfront with your audience about their limitations. So what are those limitations? The professor talked about those earlier. I will try and put those limitations in my words. Polls are a snapshot in time. They are definitely not a predictor of an outcome. And the evidence of that, well, we saw recent polls, the Brexit failure, the Trump presidency and the last Australian federal election. All the opinion polls missed those particular outcomes. I think reporting small movements, as the professor talked about earlier, every fortnight or so can be very meaningless. And why do I say that? Again, for the reasons that the professor talked about because small changes in polling often mean no change at all. There is no change at all. Many voters and indeed journalists don't properly understand what a margin of error actually is. So when you see an opinion poll, there are some key things you need to look for in weighing up the value of that polling. How many people took part in that poll? If a sample is less than 1,000 people, it's generally regarded as pretty unreliable. And usually, this information will be contained in the fine print in the poll. And the pollsters who've signed up to the council that was formed post the 2019 election have all agreed that they should be publishing that information. So in the published polls that we've seen in the papers, I set, except I think news poll hasn't been entirely clear on where their margin of error is. The information is usually contained in that fine print. If it's not there, you should be asking for it. And if they won't tell you what it is, that should give you a jolly big hint. If they're not telling you, it must be unreliable and perhaps just not worthy reporting. So let's talk about that margin of error. Often in Australian polling, it's somewhere between two and 3%. It depends on each survey because it depends on how many people were involved. And it means this, we're gonna look at it in a really simple term. If a political party is registering 50% of a vote, in a poll with a margin of error of 3%, what the pollsters are saying is that in reality, the true figure could be somewhere between 53% and 47%, but they've weighted it so that they think it's around 50%. So in reality, the real figure could be in that big margin. That is your margin of error. And that's why small movements within the margin of error are not significant because possibly, no change has happened at all. And that's why if a poll doesn't contain a margin of error, it should not be reported or you should query why it doesn't contain that vital piece of information. I also think that when you're looking at polls that trend, trends over a particular time frame, a longer time frame, are worth looking at. And that's when it can be very useful in doing analysis of parties and performance so what are examples of this? We've had some recent examples in the past two days following the federal budget. 
Today's Age and the Sydney Morning Herald have uh, a particular poll looking at the preferred Prime Minister rating. Now, if you look at the raw data for the latest figure, you know, it's pretty interesting. It's up against Mr Albanese and Mr Morrison. The Labor leader is in front at 37% of voters preferring him over the Prime Minister compared with 36%. So it's a one point difference, okay? And it's the first time that Albanese has been in, in front uh, since the polling uh, began in this particular uh, paper. Um, but if you look at the trend over a period of time, and I'm gonna hold up my graph here, it's not a PowerPoint. I don't like doing PowerPoints, sorry, but I've highlighted it. You can see, Clearly, there is a trend. The orange uh, trend is the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. The yellow is Anthony Albanese. There is a clear trend happening over a period of months, and that is worth reporting. And it's worth looking at why. So Scott Morrison's gone from 46% to 36% over 10 months, a 10-point slide. Anthony Albanese, he's gone from 23 to 37% over the same period. That's a 14-point gain. That's happened during, what has happened during that time period? We've had the vaccine rollouts, we've had the states opening up, we've had the Omicron wave. Uh, so they're all, they have all been big issues that have been playing out during uh, that particular time frame. So that trend, I think, is worth pointing out because it shows you something happening over a period of time. Let's take another example from some recent polling. The Ipsos poll, which features in the Australian Financial Review today, it had a much bigger sample size, 2,563 voters. That is much larger than the normal survey. The margin of error was 2.03%. Interestingly, reporter Phil Corey also pointed out the detail that 80% were surveyed online, the rest were done by phone. Now, I think that's kind of interesting and it's a discussion for, I think, the pollsters because some researchers actually believe that people sometimes feel more inclined to give an honest answer when they're not talking to a human. So maybe that's why um, Phil also has pointed out that particular weighting. Now that polling also found out, if you look at uh, the first preference votes, that 35% of people surveyed intended to give their vote to Labor, only 31% nominated the Liberals and Nationals. So that's first party um, preferred vote. Uh, I also think what was really interesting in that survey, when it looked at stated preferences, it still indicated that 15% of people surveyed hadn't yet decided who they're gonna vote for. And that is a large number of people. And that's also why election campaigns matter. Because during those campaigns, the political parties will be aiming at that 15% to try and sway them to vote for either major party. Now this, Sample, this survey was done from March the 30th to April the 2nd. So it was immediately after the budget and it was also during the fuel roar over claims about uh, bullying uh, from the Liberal Senator Conchetta Fury of Andy Wells. So those issues were also playing out while people were participating in this survey. This survey also broke down results to particular states. I don't know whether you, Andrew, you looked at this, uh, but that was also an interesting point but it goes to this issue that we talk about survey sample size and reliability. When they broke down um, the results by state, sorry, I'm just looking for my piece of paper, which is not handy at the moment, damn it. Um, they looked specifically also at Tasmania and the ACT. They had very, very small sample sizes and huge margins of error of 14 and 15%. Now those margins of error are just way bit too big and unreliable to be worth reporting anything about at all. Uh, and that's why also individual polling around individual electorates can be very unreliable because you're using such a small number of people in those surveys. So I always think that it's really important to look at the context of these surveys, to be upfront about the limitations and to focus on the more meaningful things like policy development and the differences between the parties. Those who carry out regular opinion polling will often include questions about other things instead of the, who are you going to vote for, the Liberal, Labor, One Nation, Greens, other. They will ask for 
preferred prime minister status, for example, or personal trust scores, dissatisfaction and satisfaction ratings and so on. Some papers will always make a front page splash out of their own commissioned polling because, well, the polling actually costs a lot of money to do. And those organisations do want a return from their investment. So they will look for other information contained in their polling for possible story angles so that they, you know, are able to report on their own polls. So that's why that they sometimes will ignore the two party preferred vote. Uh, or the primary votes because there is no difference and they'll look at other aspects of the poll. For all of that though, polls are the only way that we can tend to gauge public sentiment on a large scale in between elections and therefore we just can't ignore it. Anthea? Thank you very much Sabra, really appreciate that and, and I think that all of your audience must really um, get an enormous benefit out of actually being able to listen to somebody so knowledgeable about polling and what you're reading. So um, thank you very much for sharing those thoughts with us and uh, for underscoring many of the ones that Andrew also shared. Now, I have a, a number of questions, but in actual fact, I'm going to preface the ones that are coming up in the chat, first of all. Um, and one of them, which I think is quite an interesting question, although I'm not sure why they're necessarily signaling out, singling out uh, conservative voters, but the question says, do you think conservative voters are more likely to not participate in surveys because they uh, might be concerned about privacy or be particularly time poor? But I think that could probably apply for anything. But the question, therefore, is uh, do political polls end up being skewed to the left, uh, assuming that they are not quite so worried about privacy or are not quite so time poor? Um, and, and another sort of follow-up question from the same person really relates to the types of people that might answer their phones, I think, as both you and Andrew have, have alluded to, that um, potentially people who are lonely or, um, or alone might be keen to take part in surveys because it gives them some social interaction. Uh, so that might also skew them uh, in that particular direction. So any thoughts on the type of person that answers their phone and, and the, the approach of conservative voters versus progressive voters? Yeah. Maybe I can just um, jump in. Election, polling for elections is very difficult um, because as Sabra pointed out, um, there's a large number of people who haven't yet decided who they're going to vote for. There's a, a scary statistic that actually over 5% of people don't even know who they're going to vote for when they enter the polling booth and will make up their mind, you know, in that surround or, or not, not vote at all. So they're very difficult, it's even more difficult in America because there's no compulsory voting and a range of other factors. However, the pollsters do have an advantage. Like they're in the business of getting it right. If they get it wrong again in this election, that means two elections in a row and they get it wrong, they're gonna to have to look for another way of making their living. Um, because there was a very big backlash last time. Now, the advantage they have is that they actually come up against reality. That is the election. Hmm. So they can actually judge how their panel, if they're using a panel or their methodology, worked against the real world. And so they can actually make adjustments and they should be making adjustments for what's known as the shy Tory voter. That is something someone who, who won't actually necessarily tell anyone who they're going to vote for if they're asked. Um, and problems with sampling, like who doesn't answer the phone, a whole range of things. So pollsters will be working to factor those in. It's not as if they haven't learned. They're learning all the time. They're learning how their panel performs. So, um, you know, the points being made that in the South Australian election that we just had, mm. um, they got it within 1%. So it, even, even in the 2019, they were like within their margin of error, which is plus or minus 3%. It, it's just that they actually got it uh, the wrong way around. Um, yep, so Sabra, what, how would you respond? Uh, well, I, I think you've answered it well. Um, I would also say, yes, that South, the South, South Australian poll was a good uh, test for the polling companies and they were pretty close. So I think they felt a bit vindicated that, um, 
they had improved their methodology and they're uh, close to getting it right. And, and like you say, we will know. Um, how will we know if the, the opinion polls have got it right this time? Well, after this election, we'll know. And if they haven't, um, you know, that will just uh, further erode people's um, um, uh, trust in what they do. So they, um, there's big pressure on them to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be working overtime to get it right. Yeah. Uh, now, um, one follow-up question, though, Andrew. You have been asked, uh, even though they very much appreciate Sabra's explanation of margin of error, they've also asked, Andrew, could you explain mar margin of error from, uh, in the way that you would explain it? Yeah. So there's a confidence interval. And, um, you know, it might be a very high, like for medical research, the co confidence in, um, interval will be very high, meaning you've got to get it right 99 times out of 100. And um, the confidence interval is 95% for um, election. And that means that 19 times out of 20, if that poll was repeated 19 times out of 20, they would get the same result. And that applies to the margin of error. So as we discussed, if the margin of error is plus or minus 3%, then it's in the range 47 to 53. And that's basically all you can say with certainty. Um, so so it, it's really quite tricky, but. Even then, you, you can't put your hat on the margin of error because the margin of error assumes that everything is going well mm. and you're getting a random sample. Mm. And that may not be the case. It may not be the case. Yeah. And I, so the, the pollsters are working very hard. And this is another fact. They don't just produce the results. The results are weighted. Mm. So there'll be a weighting that make sure men and women are right, the right demographics. Mm. We talked about educational levels to add a, a, a but there's a whole range of um, factors that are used. And what happened after the 19 election is that the polling companies were asked, would you please tell us what was the weighting formula that you used? And this is the inquiry that was the Australian market mm. research group set up. And the polling companies were not willing to hand over their weighting formulas. Whereas in England, there was a similar situation and they did hand over their um, um, approach as far as I know. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. There is um, a couple of questions now to do with exit polling um, and how accurate that is. And, and one in particular about whether or not that is what Anthony Green actually uses to predict his results on election night. But I wondered if both of you had a view about the, the role and the reliability of exit polling. So exit, Sarah? Yeah, exit polls generally aren't reliable. Uh, and generally the reason why exit polls happen is to give um, um, TV news bulletins something to talk about while they're waiting for actual results to come in. And no, they're not generally reliable. And my advice would be to steer clear of them. Um, yeah. Andrew, did you want to comment? Yeah. Like there's exit polls and exit polls. Uh, probably the best ones are, which actually give people coming out of the booth a, an exact replica of the voting paper and ask them to mark it as they had marked it. And, and those ones have actually got quite a, a good um, record. With regard to Anthony Green, um, you're dealing with someone who's got a, like an encyclopedic knowledge <laughs> of electorates. Um, and he understands not only the electorate, but particularly polling booths in the electorates. So as the data for the polling booths come in, rather than just for the whole seat, but polling booth, he can actually see if there's a swing or not a swing going on at that micro level. Thanks. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, just sticking with you, Andrew, because I know you would have a view on this and be able to explain it. There was another question about the use of incentives in getting people to complete surveys and polls. Yep, yeah, um, people were... That's an interesting point. Um, what, uh, one of the things that market researchers do is they try and create panels that will represent the population. Yeah? And to get people to join the panels, um, it may well be that people are given an incentive, like say $20 to join, $3 in points for every survey that you do. And, and that's become pretty much standard, more so overseas, but I guess we're heading in the same direction. I don't think they necessarily affect the accuracy of the polls because, again, the pollsters 
scientists are very much in the business of making sure that their sample represents the population. So they'll work very hard at it. And it may be like this happens in America, that if you're like a middle-aged, um, re relatively well-educated person, that is easy to get to do surveys, your incentive will be $10. If you happen to be someone who they really after, it's hard to get, you might get an incentive of $100. Um, but their business is to be accurate. And polls, unlike other things, um, it's a day of reckoning, isn't it? Um, with a lot of other market research, there isn't such a day of reckoning. With polls, there is, and particularly in this case. Thanks, Andrew. Sabra, did you have any views about um, uh, people being encouraged to complete surveys using incentives? No, I, I don't. Um, um, I mean, that would make it a more costly exercise, and I don't know how practical that would be. Oh, well, I might just throw in a couple of questions. One, one is, um, given the frequency of surveying that happens at this particular point in the, in the electoral election cycle, um, is this continuous surveying of random groups um, problematic? I mean, are, are pollsters actually getting a different set of 1,000 each time and what's the effect of that? Or are they ending up with many of the same people each time? And is that a good or a bad thing? Andrew? Yeah. It's not, the issue I think is how you can actually get reliable data. And given the difficulty of random telephone and um, other methods, which are uh, totally random, pollsters have been forced to go to panels. So a number of the leading organizations established their own panels. And I think if you're looking at panels, the issue to consider is, was that panel recruited on a random basis, such as the Social Research Centre Life in Australia panel, or is it an opt-in panel? Now, you can have a panel that has half a million people in it or a million people in it, and organisations will sample their own panels. Like a, a very good example is the ABC's election compass which has a, like hundreds of thousands of people on it. But, but the issue becomes, did people volunteer to join it? And are you particularly getting the ABC audience? Or is it a, a, a sample that is representing the whole population? Now, the weighting formulas will try to connect the panel with the population, so it's representative of the population. But if it's opt-in, there's always that question, of have you actually missed a segment of the community that didn't opt in? Yeah, were they the lonely people hoping to, to find some social interaction in some way or not? Or people, you know, with strong views or, or people who think that they've got something to contribute by making their views known. Um, Sabra, can I ask you maybe to reflect back in, in early on in your career and, and to think about how, how did you learn how to assess polls? What were the things you were looking for what was the, what did you see that, that maybe made you think perhaps this poll isn't necessarily the, uh, making the most reasonable assessment of what society was thinking? How, how did you start to validate these polls? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think um, many of us questioned the use of polls and polling um, sort of during the Rudd, Gillard, Abbott, Turnbull uh, leadership changes because, yeah, polls were really weaponised during that era um, against uh, the, the individuals concerned and um, people tried to convince others that small changes were in fact big changes. So, I mean, I really wanted to know more information uh, early on about, you know, how the polls were done, what margin of error meant, um, and, uh, you know, trying to uh, influence others um, about the merits of reporting those things, that it didn't, you know, that we shouldn't be doing a, a quick rip and read of various um, polls just based on those small movements because it meant nothing. Um, you know, a one to two, two point change actually meant, could mean no change at all and it wasn't worth reporting and therefore not news. Um, <laughs> You've clearly mentioned some, um, you know, Casey Briggs and, and others that you've mentioned that yeah. are 
becoming far more sophisticated about how to interpret polls. Definitely. Do you think overall, journalists' capabilities around this are improving? And uh, do you think that... Yeah. I think we've become, I think we have become more cautious, um, but it's worth having the conversation too. Uh, because, like I said from the outset, I think there's a lot of mystique around the polls and the, there's a lot of misunderstanding about them and the, the public about what they actually say and what they mean. So, it's really good to be having this conversation and also to be upfront about what the limitations are. But there um, are clearly demands for headlines. Yeah, the there are frequent basis so that ability to capture something and as, as Andrew pointed out if 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 the organization has created its own panel then you you want to oh, and you also Sabra you want to get that value for money yes. out, um, out of that particular investment so it is interesting when it comes to um, quest, how you phrase your questions in order to get something that might result in a headline in some way shape or form yeah sure um Andrew, I just want to turn to you um, because one of the things that you and I have had a, a particular interest in is about um, subgroups and, um, and the views of minority communities. And we often find uh, that politicians will choose to try to speak on behalf of a particular smaller subgroup or, or community. And yet polling and surveying, it's very, very difficult, isn't it, to actually be able to get reliable data about views of particular subgroups. I know you've mentioned the states, but perhaps we should talk a bit more about if you wanted to understand the youth vote in, in a particular area or you wanted to understand where, um, you know, particular migrants might be actually thinking about things. Yeah, really important issue. And Sabra made that point about the Ipsos poll with 2,500 or so. I mean, the only reason that you would have such a large sample is to enable you to disaggregate the data. But again, as Sabra pointed out, it, it doesn't work for Tasmania and ACT, probably doesn't even work for much else. Mm. Because as the sample goes down, the margin of error goes up. Um, and you're looking at, you know, well over plus or minus 5%. So it's not all that useful. But I, I just want to reflect on the amount of money and attention that goes on polling for electoral purposes. And then the amount of effort that goes into polling for understanding segments of our society. You know, what do young people think at, at that example you used? Or what do certain immigrant communities think? Or what do, et cetera. Uh, we do much better if we directed our uh, resources, not a hundred to one ratio in terms of electoral polling, but some sort of better balance that enables us to get an insight into segments of our society and to understand how they're uh, faring. Because if we track, you know, the next two months and see which polls are, are getting headlines and investment and which are not, uh, that's a huge issue. And I think for journalists, it can be more difficult to interpret social research, uh, it, relatively easy to interpret political findings, because they're always in our face. But in terms of contributing to um, knowledge about our own society, I think some of that nuanced polling is where the yield is. Hmm. Sabra, did you have any thoughts on that? Um, no, no, uh, I mean, I don't. But I mean, that also comes down to organisations um, having good links with the community too, so that they're able to tap into what's happening around the ground, um, not only in, um, you know, outer suburban areas of the metropolitan cities, but um, across regional Australia as well. And I guess, you know, that's where um, taxpayers get value for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, <laughs> we've, got, we've got bureaus right around the country, you know, where every day, talking with people about the issues you know, that matter to them, especially as we're, you know, coming up to the election. We're talk, off, talking with you know, what people want to see um, and what they're, what they're hoping the parties will deliver for them. Absolutely. I think um, we, we've certainly noticed that, that um, the, the nuances and uh, that exist with, within subgroups themselves, it's really, really difficult and probably quite dangerous to make judgments based on incredibly small populations and incredibly small surveys. Our previous webinars that we've done with the Walkley Foundation 
have um, investigated some of these ways of growing relationships, such as you say, um, you know, the, those that are spread across Australia, the individual journalists really need to be able to have broad networks so they can tap in and ask these sorts of questions and say how, how similar or different are these views because they're very diverse. And when it comes to a single question, you know, do you like Scott or do you like Anthony? That, that's, that's one thing. But when you start to want to actually understand what the context is by which people are making those decisions, it is something where we need to get lots more information. Um, I would um, actually like, as we draw to this discussion to a close, I would like to thank um, Andrew and Sabra for joining us for this um, terrific discussion about polling. Um, I noticed that Sabra has also provided a number of links to different articles, and I would encourage people to go and have a look at those as well if you haven't already. Um, and I would like to thank Andrew very much for spending some time talking through polling and surveying and giving some sense of what trends and, uh, and um, the types of questions that you need to ask in order to make sure that you get accurate information from the polls that you're doing. And as you mentioned, Sabra, and I should have mentioned at the beginning, I would also like to thank the Walkley Foundation for um, being the hosts of today's event. It's, um, it's been terrific to be able to have this opportunity. So um, thank you everybody very much. And uh, I hope you have a very pleasant evening. So thank you.